I have here another example of a tracing question that involves exceptions, and you will notice for the first, but probably not the last time in this course, the example is so big it doesn't actually fit on one page. So it has two functions. There's main, which is pretty beefy, and main calls a function called f. And so I've put the definition of f on the next page. f is also pretty beefy. Um, I've put a prototype for f here just so we can remind ourselves what we're doing. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll collect all of my output on this page. So if I need to generate output when I'm in F, I'll just scroll back and use this page. Otherwise, I'm going to begin tracing with main. And I'll put the diagram for main on this page and the diagram for F on the next one. Um, you might uh, find it a lot easier to pull up the posted version of this code on the side so that you have the whole thing in one place as we trace along. So I start main, I get to line number four. Line number four is to generate some freebie output. It just prints out main one. Then I get to line five and I create a variable called sum. And sum is initialized to 1,000. And then I hit line six and there it is. I have to start a try block. So I'm now one layer deep in try blocks. And this is the try block that began on line six. Okay, line seven. Line seven is an assignment statement. I'm gonna cross off the left-hand side and observe that I am calling the function f. So I'm gonna pass in two and four as the arguments to f. I'll just make a note of that. I'll just hold my place there. We'll go to the next page, work out the um, return value of this call to f. I'll put an arrow to make it obvious to myself that I was on line seven, and then we'll come back. So I'm calling f with the first argument start equal to two and the second argument end equal to four. So here's a nice scoping box for f. I'm going to make a very large scoping box, um, which might be a bit foreboding. Okay, so then I make my two variables start and end for the two parameters. And we recall that start was set to 2 and end was set to 4. Um, I'm now ready to begin executing f. And so the next thing I do when I hit line number 23 here is I create a variable called total and I set it equal to 0. And then I notice I'm going to have a huge cascade of different scopes starting suddenly. So I, I, eyeballing it, maybe observe that I'm going to need a lot of space for that. So I make a pretty big scoping box for this try block. Uh, in fact, we pr probably want to be a little bit more precise than that. So we make a pretty big box here, keeping in mind that we're probably going to have to cram a lot of stuff into it. So this is the try block on line 24. Recall that when we called f in main, we were in a try block. So we're now two layers deep in try blocks, which is fine. We can have try blocks inside of try blocks inside of try blocks. Um, the next thing I do is I ask the question, is start less than 1? Okay, well, in the context of my current scope, which is that, the, value, the variable start is this thing. Start is not less than 1, so I skip over it. And then I hit this for loop. Oh, great. So I've got to run a for loop now. So I'm going to have to create a scope, a nested scope for the for loop. There it is. Um, and this is the for loop that began on line 27. The loop uh, variable would be the variable i in this case, uh, which is an int, which is initialized to the variable, the value of the variable start, which is 2. Um, and it, although we can take a few shortcuts when we trace code like this, it's I think worth it when we notice weird stuff like try blocks inside loops to trace the loop very cautiously. So we should do the 111 style low level paranoid tracing of the loop. So I'll ask the loop, the, the, I'll directly ask myself this loop question at every iteration. Is i less than or equal to end? Well, end in this context has the value 4 and i has the value 2. So the answer in this case is yes. So i is equal to 2 um, and uh, that's less than or equal to end. So I enter the loop. And of course, the first thing I do is open up a try block. I am now three layers deep into try blocks. Okay, this is the try block that began on line 28. And the first thing I ask is, is i greater than 5? And the answer is no. So I add, I do total plus equals i. Uh, okay, so total is this variable out here, and I add the value of i to that. So total is now going to be the value 2. And then uh, my try block ends. So I destroy the try block scope on my diagram and everything inside of it. Not too exciting because there's not too much inside of it. The next thing that happens is I skip over the catch blocks because there weren't any exceptions, and I end up on line 35, which is the end of the scope for the for loop. So recall that when we hit this closing curly bracket, all the variables I create inside my loop have to be destroyed with one special case, which is that variables that are created here in the initializer clause for the for loop do not get destroyed when the scope wraps around. Um, and so you often, I've recommended, uh, and I may have done this in person by now, 
to, you might want to indicate, if it's complicated, which variables have that status, where they are going to get destroyed when the for loop finally permanently ends, but the loop counter, of course, doesn't get destroyed at the end of every iteration, because that wouldn't make any sense. So you can indicate that this is going to survive longer than the rest of the variables in the scope. Now, all of that is a moot point, fortunately, because there are no other variables declared inside of this for loop. So I go around again, I increment i, i is now equal to 3. I ask the loop condition, is i less than or equal to end? The answer is yes, so I run the loop again. Okay, so I run my try block, I start this up, and I mean, I, I might begin to see a pattern here, and you might actually skip a couple of steps at this point, because it becomes clear that nothing interesting is going to happen until i is equal to 4. Um, but I'm going to run through it all the way through just in case. It doesn't hurt to be too careful in this case. Um, okay, so I open my try block. On line 29, this condition doesn't matter. i is not greater than 5, so I say total plus equals i. Okay, the total is 2. Total plus equals 3, so I'm adding 2 to 3. I get 5, and then the try block ends. All right, and uh, then I go down to line 35. The for loop wraps around. Uh, I, I observe that there are no other variables to destroy. I do i plus plus, so i is now equal to 4. I ask the question, is i less than or equal to end? And the answer is yes, end is 4, i is 4, so it's good. So I enter the loop again. I open up my try block. I know already, okay, so 4 is not greater than 5, so I don't do this. Total plus equals i. Total is 5, 5 plus 4 is 9. And then the loop ends. Okay, so I end, my try block ends. Uh, I reach the end of the scope of the loop. I, uh, I should be careful to say the loop doesn't actually end. The scope of the loop ends. The loop body ends. I go back up here. I add 1 to i. Now i is equal to 5. And then I ask the question, is i less than or equal to end? The answer now is no. i is 5. End is 4. 5 is not less than or equal to 4. So now the loop ends, and everything inside of its scope is destroyed, and that includes i. So it's important to remember, of course, that the value that i takes at the very last moment is 5, not 4, because i gets updated one last time before the loop ends. But fortunately for us, we get to destroy i afterwards, so even if I made a mistake there, that wouldn't have made a big deal. Um, okay, so now I am now, at, I've reached the end of the for loop. I observe that no exceptions have been thrown, and uh, I don't go into this catch block. So I, on line 36, I end my try block, and there hasn't been any exceptions, and so I just uh, erase the try block. There we go. And uh, I skip over the catch block, and then I return total. Oh, okay, so the return value of f is going to be 9. Okay, so I make a note of that, and then I'm going to destroy the scope of f. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to replace, I'm going to, uh, replace my call to f with the, with the return value, which is 9. I'm going to go back to this, this page and um, I might need a call to f again. And because it's on a separate page, I will cheat a little bit and I won't fully erase the scoping box for f because it was, at least by my standards, a reasonably well-drawn box. So it's on a different page so I won't get confused, but I do still delete all of the variables inside of it just in case. So I'm back in main. I just uh, finished uh, the right-hand side of line 7, and so now I can keep going there. So on line 7, I'm writing sum equals 9. So I'm in, the, I'm in the scope of this try block, and there's no variable called sum in there, so I go outside and take a look, and there is a variable called sum outside, so I set the sum to be 9. There we go. Um, and then on line 8, I print out main 2. And then I print out the sum equals and then I print out 9. That's the current value of the sum. Uh, okay, so now I hit line number 9. On line 9, I call the function f again. So I'm going to make start equal to 3 and end equal to 6. I'm going to cross out the left-hand side, make a note to myself that I was on line 9, and I'm going to head over to the next page where I am going to run f. So start is 3, end is 6. So I draw those in. There's start. It's 3. There's end. It's 6. These are both ints. And I begin executing f. So on line 23, as I did before, I create a new variable called total. And it's an int, and it's set to 0. And then I enter a try block. Well, surprise, surprise. OK, so that's line 24. I'm entering a new try block. It's going to be this big one, just like last time. There we go. And um, then I ask the question on line 25, is start less than 1? The answer is no, start is equal to 3, so I skip down to line 27. And on line 27, I open a for loop. 
So fortunately, we already did this function once, and so we have a basic idea of what's going to happen here. Um, on line 27, I entered this for loop, uh, and it creates a loop index whose name is i. i is an int. i starts at 3. And then I ask the question, is i less than or equal to end? Well, end is equal to 6, and so the answer is yes. And so I start up this try block once again. On line 28, I start the try block. I just make a note of that. There it is. And I ask the question, is i greater than 5? The answer is no. And so I keep going. I, I write total plus equals i. Well, total is 0, so 0 plus 3 is 3. And then the try block ends, and then the loop body ends. And as before, so I'm now on line 35. As before, the variable i is insulated from being destroyed every time the loop body ends, um, and it gets incremented, and I end up back at line 27. So i is now equal to 4. And I ask the question, is 4 less than or equal to 6? The answer is yes, so the loop keeps going. And here's where even I am going to speed things up a little bit. So I observe that nothing interesting is going to happen until either this condition is false or this condition is true. Otherwise, I, I've sort of picked up on the pattern. If, if this condition is true, the loop will run. If this condition is false, all I'm going to do in the middle of the loop is this line. So I'm actually going to run a bit faster here. I'm going to take the calculated risk that I know enough about this code to be able to, to speed this loop up a little bit. So when i equals 4, what do I do? Well, 4 is not uh, greater than 5, so this condition is still false. Um, and so total plus equals 4. OK, well, the total is 3. 3 plus 4 is 7. And then I go around again. Now i is equal to 5. Is 5 less than or equal to 6? Yes. OK. Is 5 greater than 5? No. So the same thing happens as before. Total plus equals i. OK, so total is 7. 7 plus 5 is 12. And um, then I go back up here, and I update i again. And now I slow down. So when I slow down here, I observe, OK, so i is going to be equal to end. So that's one reason to slow down. But also, I've been keeping an eye uh, on when i ends up larger than 5. And here it is. So on the iteration where i is set to 6, I ask this question, is i less than or equal to end? The answer is yes. And so I enter my try block. And now I draw it all the way out. Enter my try block. There it is. It's the one that starts on line 28. And on line 29, I ask the question, is i greater than 5? And the answer now is, yes, it is. And so I'm going to throw an exception. I throw domain error. OK, so now we recall from the last example what we do when exceptions get thrown. OK, so I throw domain error and I begin asking, OK, what scope am I in? OK, the current scope, the try block. This is a try block, so can it catch domain error? And the answer is yes. OK, so I can catch a domain error, which means I get jammed right onto line 33. The scope of the try block ends. There we go. And then I head down to line 33, and I enter a catch block. And so I'll make a note to myself that I'm actually in the scope of a catch block. And then I generate some output. It's going to be f caught domain error. So I'm going to go back to the previous page and just write that down. So f caught domain error. And then the catch block ends. So on line 34, I'm out of the catch block. And I'm actually buried in the middle of this loop still. So I get to line 35. I'm at the end of an iteration of the loop. I go up here. I update the value of i to 7. I ask the question, is 7 less than or equal to 6? The answer, of course, is no. And so the loop ends. And so I destroy the loop and all of its contents. There we go. And that puts me down after line 35. I'm here at line 36, the end of this try block. And no exceptions got thrown. Even though we were several layers deep in try blocks, it turns out the innermost try block handed our, handled our problem for us. Now, in the posted version of this code, there is a little note that asks a question like, hey, what if in this catch block I threw an exception? And I would recommend trying that exercise out. Now that you have an, an idea about the general flavor of this example, what happens if I throw an exception in the middle of the catch block around? around line 33, because then we might make some use of those other try blocks. But in any case, I don't go into this catch block here, because no exception got caught by this try block here. And that brings me down to line 40, where I return total. Well, the value of total here is 12. So the return value of f is going to be 12. I'm going to go back to the previous page to make a note of that. So here is the call to f that I was using. It's going to the return value is 12. I'll remove the uh, I'll um, erase the scribble over the left-hand side. I'm going to go back here and just clean this up. So I really hope I don't need the scope for f again, but just in case, I'll leave it on the diagram. But I will remove all of the variables. 
And then I go to line number nine and I say, okay, well, I was in the middle of line nine. Line nine is now setting sum to equal 12. So I set sum to equal 12. And then I print some more output, main three. And I print out the value of the sum. All right. And uh, then the try block ends. So I'm now ending the try block that started on line number six, observing that strangely, I didn't actually catch anything inside of main. Main was set up to catch just about anything that could possibly be thrown, but it didn't need to. It was caught all the way on the inside. As I said, though, the modified version of the exercise that the posted version suggests, maybe it does need those catch blocks in main. And so then I get to line number 18, where I print out main four. And then on line 19, I print out the sum equals and then the final value of sum, and here it is 12. Unlike in the previous example where we had some funny nested scope shenanigans, there is only one variable in main called sum, and it's this one. There's no variable created inside the nested scope uh, of the try block.